committee will come back to order. Um, we are here now to hear um, AC 24-1339, Representative Rutenau. You are up. Thank you, Madam Chair, and to the fellow members of the Energy and Environment Committee. Really appreciate your time today. Today I stand before you not just as a representative, but also as someone who has seen firsthand how pollution has made life harder for people in our neighborhoods. I represent Commerce City, which contains areas that aren't just some of the most polluted areas in the state, but in the entire nation. We've long been considered what some call a sacrifice zone. Areas written off as lost to industrial pollution where residents face health risks without the economic or political power to fight back. But today, we reclaim our narrative. The Environmental Justice Act from 2021 was supposed to be a beacon of hope. A promise to our communities that their voices would be heard, their struggles acknowledged, and their health taken care of. But what we have witnessed in the last year of rulemaking is a betrayal of that promise. We're here to present HB 24 1339, an important piece of legislation designed to address Colorado's role in our climate crisis and to ensure that the air we breathe is safer for vulnerable communities across the state. This bill builds on the groundwork laid by the Environmental Justice Act 2021, which is supposed to guide our state towards substantial reductions in industrial pollution and safeguard our disproportionately impacted communities. Yet three years later, we find ourselves compelled to act again because the promise of regulations for cleaner, safer air remain unfulfilled. The very industries that were supposed to be regulated for their pollution have instead been given loopholes that allow them to evade their responsibilities and undermine the health of our communities. This bill seeks to close those loopholes. It mandates specific emission reductions directly at the source, ensuring that vulnerable communities stop bearing the brunt of industrial contamination. It abolishes the pay to pollute option, reinforcing that the health of our citizens is not for sale. The co-pollutants we're trying to restrict, volatile organic compounds, particulate matter, oxides of nitrogen, hazardous air pollutants like benzene and toluene, are not mere inconveniences. They're harmful and deadly. Their continued emission puts at risk our children, our elderly, and our workers, leading to respiratory diseases, cancer, and premature death. Additionally, the specter of catastrophic climate change looms large over all of us. Each step we fail to take towards reducing greenhouse gas emissions pushes us closer to the brink. Moreover, this bill not only protects the environment, but also creates economic opportunities through compliance. Strengthening environmental regulations often requires additional labor for construction, installation of new technologies, and ongoing monitoring. And beyond direct job creation, Cleaning up our quote-unquote sacrifice zones opens the door to new businesses that previously shied away from setting up in these areas due to the high pollution levels. By transforming these areas into cleaner and safer environments, we make it more attractive for diverse business opportunities, which can lead to greater economic growth and more vibrant communities. But I want to dive deeper into the urgency of our action today. Climate change is an existential threat that spares no corner of our beloved state. Colorado faces increasing wildfires, reduced snowpacks, more erratic weather patterns, and severe droughts. Our agricultural sectors, water reserves, and natural landscapes suffer immensely under these conditions. If we fail to act, the very essence of what makes Colorado, Colorado could vanish. We owe it to vulnerable communities across the state, to ourselves, and to future generations to take decisive action. We cannot continue to allow our communities to serve as dumping grounds for industrial pollutants. It's time to prioritize people over polluters. It's time to deliver on the promises of the Environmental Justice Act. It's time to protect our environment, our health, and our future. Thank you in advance for your support. Thank you. Um, and Representative Weissman. Thank you, Madam Chair and Committee. Um, I want to start with a few further uh, thank yous, first and foremost, to the coalition that we've worked with on this bill for many months and uh, with members have been involved in the underlying issues for many years uh, before the bill, the, the idea for this bill uh, ever existed. Uh, also uh, to my co-prime sponsor uh, who, uh, like me, uh, did a degree in economics 
found his way to law school, uh, studied environmental law, uh, has worked uh, in environmental organizations, uh, and, and unlike the representative of the paradigm communities in our state when we talk about these issues, this is my last session in the House of Representatives due to term limits. Uh, I look forward to my co-firm sponsor being involved in and fighting for these issues uh, for years to come. And, and Madam Chair, thank you also just for your grace in scheduling here um, as we uh, work to get this to a place where we could present it uh, to the committee today. My comments are going to be a little bit higher level than uh, they often uh, are, although, of course, we are here for questions and there will be witnesses to go further into details. First and foremost, 1339 is a bill about environmental justice. Secondarily, 1339 is a bill that touches on some of the fundaments of environmental law and how the work of environmental law actually happens, has happened for decades, and is going to need to happen for the sake of all of those who are going to walk the surface of the earth in decades to come. So I'll say a bit about environmental justice and environmental law, and then we'll turn to the strike the law amendment that we intend to offer this afternoon. I've given hard copies uh, to Ms. Falco. Uh, it was distributed uh, per the rules uh, previously as well. We could talk for hours about what environmental justice means and why it matters, and in particular, why it matters to many of the witnesses, residents of our state, who have come, to, who have taken the trouble to be here today. I know we can't do that for hours, so I'll just invite the committee to consider two things. One, in the entirety of how all of us in the state, country, and world have used and developed natural resources <coughs> for over a century, our finite land and formerly unpolluted air and waters, we have all benefited from a higher material standard of living. Compared to even a few centuries ago, frankly, we all live like kings and queens. But we have not all experienced the consequences of our use of natural resources evenly. Some of us are relatively more insulated from brown air, brown water, mysterious yellow dust, cancer clusters, the heat of scorching summer, the more. Some of us suffer through these as part of daily life and through the truncation of their lives or the lives of their loved ones as a result. That is environmental in justice. And unfortunately, this is a lot of the world that we have brought up to this point, and that we now task ourselves to change. Second point. More simply, than the first, I think environmental justice can be captured in the idea that if we don't want to breathe it, drink it, smell it, or live next to it, then we probably shouldn't make anyone else breathe it, drink it, smell it, or live next to it either. Now, concerning environmental law, from the vantage point of someone who studied this subject pretty extensively in law school, who used to work for environmental organizations, and who was a member of this committee for five years until the present session, environmental law is heavily administrative law. And I'm sorry if this is lawyer speak, but it's important here. Administrative law is that uniquely American domain in which all three branches of government and members of the public intersect to effectuate a fair bit of the complex work of modern government in this domain and others. First, the legislative branch sets forth broad policy goals. Then the executive branch, through agencies, is tasked to undertake rulemakings, flesh out those goals guided by the statutory framework we call the Administrative Procedure Act. Finally, the judicial branch may be, although it isn't always, called upon to review executive branch rules to make sure that they have not strayed too far from legislative intent and statutory text. Of course, public participates in rulemaking processes on the front end, and it's the right to go to court and seek judicial review on the back end. As a complex, scientifically and technically heavy field, environmental law has been and will remain a heavily administrative law domain since what we now even call environmental law and evolved out of common law longer ago than any of us serving on the committee or presenting the bill has been alive. We're not here to change that. However, the heavily administrative law nature of environmental law requires that more so than in a lot of policy domains in the legislature, we as elected legislators keep our eyes on the end goals over the intermediate and long term, which brings us to 1339 and our strike the introduced bill proposed to change the composition of the APCC uh, and uh, some enhancements to rulemaking guiding language about industrial climate pollution. In response to a lot of discussions over many weeks, in particular uh, concerns that the voice of workers would be impacted by AQCC changes, the strike below omits any change to the AQCC entirely. In the interest of brevity, we've also dropped the legislative declaration, although we continue to stand by those principles. Uh, instead, we, we further invite the committee and the strike below to consider uh, some language to fortify statutory guidance for other rulemakings, uh, which, like 
the industrial source provisions come from 1266 the 2021 foundational climate law uh, that we're to talk about today. The thread connecting the two parts of the strike below is that they both assert an interest in continued urgent progress toward climate pollution reduction and environmental justice goals that this legislature asserted in HB 211266 and in numerous other bills over the last several sessions. We put words, words on the pages of the statute books in those bills. The point of 1339, including our strike below, is that we should actually stand behind those words and more importantly stand behind the communities whose concerns those words seek to address. Thank you, Lillian, here for questions. Thank you, and before we go to questions from the committee, I do want to say there is an overflow ne room next door in 109. When we get to the witness phase, I will be calling the current panel and the panel that will be coming up on deck to make sure that people have their time to make their way into the committee room. So just so you know, you aren't going to lose your place, okay? Um, members, do we have questions for our sponsors? Uh, Representative Evans. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you for the, to the sponsors. Um, how does this, and I'm gonna structure most of my comments to the strike below since, you know, fundamentally that's what we're ultimately gonna end up talking about. So how does the strike below interact with the um, GEM2 rulemaking that we just went through about a year ago? Representative Weissman. Uh, thank you, Rep. Evans. Uh, you know, it's a very apt question. There's going to be a lot of talk about that uh, today. Uh, part, not all of the strike below, uh, is informed heavily by the way that that rulemaking went. To provide some history here, uh, HB 2112-66 was comprehensive legislation. Uh, part of that, you know, a relatively small chunk was to direct uh, rulemaking at uh, reducing climate pollution uh, from what was defined or just referenced as the industrial sector. Uh, there was a rulemaking uh, last year. Uh, there was participation in it from folks that you will hear from. Uh, in the opinion of a lot of witnesses, I think we'll hear from today, uh, there were some shortcomings. Again, this is this is why I went on, I hope not too laboriously, about um, administrative law. We can't do every detail and statutory text here in this domain. Uh, this is scientifically and technically uh, intricate. There is a role for um, for administrative rulemaking. Um, however. Uh, you know, members who have been around this committee for years in particular, I think, will appreciate that there have been some frustrations. Uh, rulemaking is like the process of the building. No one party in that process gets everything that they want. Um, I've seen that for years, too. A lot of people have here. Uh, I think, though, uh, in, in our judgment as sponsors, um, uh, there was enough concern with this particular rulemaking and how it deviated from legislative intent in the first instance not deviated from what's on the, the page here, deviated from what's already in the CRS, uh, that part of what we're trying to do here uh, is, is kind of say we meant it the first time. Um, that's, that's a brief answer on, on a uh, potentially very deep question. Okay, um, thank you. Any additional questions for our sponsors? Okay, and keep in mind we have a lot of witnesses today, so we'll um, make sure we leave some question time for them as well. That's Representative DeGraff. Absolutely, Madam. Chair. We have lots of, uh, so what I see again is we have lots of environmental and administrative law hung up. Uh, I've been trying to engage everybody on this for a really long time. It's not uh, what I don't think see is a lot of uh, environmental science. We don't have really any environmental science that's going on here, just law and administration. It's really not that intricate when the potential carbon dioxide reduction that can be affected by the state is 0.125 gigatons. The atmosphere contains over 3,200 gigatons. That means of the 10%, less than 10% that, uh, that uh, the greenhouse gas effect that carbon dioxide does, creates, participates in, Colorado can affect that by less than 40 parts in a million. The individual here, any individual in this room, as I've showed you over and over, as confirmed by everyone on this panel mathematically, the individual carbon footprint is less than one part in a trillion. So I'm on board with the pollutants that you refer to as co-pollutants, except they're pollutants because carbon dioxide is not a pollutant. And I'm on board with the end goal of taking care of people's lives, but we're spending hundreds of millions of dollars per year on, on what is not even a a pollutant. And again, this is where the science is. So we're conflating, we're conflating these two things of pollutants and not. So 
I've asked repeatedly, and uh, so far, uh, at least one of you has uh, refused to actually state what the end goal of this is. So when we say we have climate goals, and nobody tells me what the climate, nobody can actually articulate what the climate goal is, or how carbon dioxide is going to achieve them, how am I supposed to take a bill seriously that puts these two things in, in position? Because what we're doing in, the, in a bill like this is we're spending money We're spending money on pollutants, and we're spending money on carbon dioxide, and they're very different. One, one is a pollutant that harms people, and one is a molecule that is the basis of life. And so that's where I get, I have a problem when these, a bill like this conflates the two of them, because again, your car, because what we're doing on carbon dioxide and chasing this, and chasing this idea of climate change is you can do nothing about it. Like I said yesterday, we're not climate, nobody here is climate cops. There's nothing you can do on the carbon footprint, and sir, I'd tell you to look at the math, that you can do one part in a trillion. Okay, so, so I'm, 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 I just wanna know what is the climate goal? What do you, what if, what, what will 40 parts in a million, if we were to achieve net zero in, in Colorado, what would that 40 parts per million change in terms of climate? Representative. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Representative DeGraff, for the question. I'll try to keep my answer brief because I know that we've got a lot of witnesses that are, maybe are excited about answering this specific question as well. But I'll tell you what I think the climate goal is, and that's us doing our part. We are in the midst of a climate crisis. I laid out all the harms that Colorado may face, and there are a lot of other harms that people are facing across the world, folks that have fewer resources than we do to be able to handle those crises. And so I think Colorado needs to do its part and act as a shining light, a lighthouse for the rest of the nation and the world to make sure that we all handle this collective action problem that's gonna take all of us. Just because we can't handle this by ourselves doesn't mean we're not mandated morally to do our part. Thank you, and um, I think um, Representative Miles. So, um, uh, I do have a different question, but doing your part is not actually the answer to that question. Doing your part of what? Um, my question would be, can somebody define disproportionately impacted communities? Representative White. Uh, Rep. Bottoms, I'm very glad you asked. Um, the concept of a disproportionately impacted community, or DIC for short, uh, is integral to what we're talking about here. Uh, Conceptually, you know, it's not new. Uh, it's to me, it's bound up in the notion of environmental justice in the first instance. But our predecessors in 2021 uh, did provide a definition, targeted uh, at 24.4.1092B12. Uh, that definition was further uh, modernized, elaborated a little bit uh, in 2023 as part of a bill that I believe Rep. Valdez uh, was the Cochrane uh, sponsor of. Uh, in the interest of brevity, I'm maybe not going to go through the whole thing, uh, but it revolves around uh, essentially uh, census block groups with certain characteristics. Uh, we, we use a, a block group because other than the decennial census, it's essentially the smallest or most atomic uh, level, geographic level that the Census Bureau uh, tabulates any data to. You can find it in the, the five-year American Community uh, Survey data set. Uh, so a, a couple examples I'll try to read in, in summary fashion. Portion of population of households below 200% uh, federal poverty level is 40% or more. Uh, portion of households that spend more than 30% of household income on housing, we call that the rent burden, uh, is more than 50%. Portion of population that identifies as people of color is greater than 40%. Portion of population that is linguistically isolated is greater than 20%. There are others in the interest of time. I will not go all the way. Uh, through them, but basically where a census block uh, meets one or more of these characteristics, according to the official data, uh, it is a disproportionately impacted community. Um, Representative Bonds, follow up? So focusing on the word disproportionately, um, how much do you think, what percentage of the state would you put into this category? Uh, Representative Weiss. Uh Thank you. And, uh, on the last question, I might have referred to the census block at the end. That was erroneous, I mean block group. To the present question, um, appreciate that. Um, there is a mathematical answer, and rather than, um, 
I can't retrieve it from my notes right now. Um, when we step back and give the table to witnesses, uh, I'll try to get the answer and maybe text it to you um, because it's a fair question I want to answer. <coughs> one more follow up. Okay, one more. Um, I actually know the percentage, so I would like you to answer the next question, which is using the word disproportionately, over 48% of the state, that's almost half, is in a disproportionately impacted community. Does that, does that make sense to anybody? Representative Weissman. Uh, what I would say in response to that, uh, Rep. Bottoms, is uh, testifies to uh, legacy of, of, of pollution and inequality in our society, and we're here to try to change that today. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, first, I'd just like to say that I'm the kind of doctor that my grandmother does not tell her friends about, but thank you for, for the honorific. Uh, my name is Alex Degoli, I'm Director of State Climate Policy at Environmental Defense Fund. Uh, EDF stands in strong support uh, of HB 1339. Um, we've been deeply engaged uh, in climate policy in Colorado for years, uh, including specifically in industrial sector policy. Uh, we uh, worked to support passage of the EJ Act in 2021, uh, and we were parties to both the GEM 1 and GEM 2 rulemakings at the Air Commission. Uh, as Representative Weissman uh, put it with a good bit of legal weight behind it, uh, this bill is before you today because Colorado has an implementation problem when it comes to climate and environmental justice policy. Uh, the legislature, including uh, many bills starting here, has, has passed uh, some of the strongest laws in the country on both climate and environmental justice. Uh, but too often, the results uh, of those policies passed by this body are delayed and weakened during implementation. Uh, the bill here, 1339, provides additional direction to the Air Commission uh, in implementing its existing mandate to issue rules that protect Colorado's people and the planet uh, from several of Colorado's largest sources of both greenhouse gases and harmful air pollution, as the sponsors mentioned. Uh, this was the intent of the EJ Act. Uh, it has a dual mandate to both uh, cut climate pollution swiftly uh, and to uh, reduce health harming co pollutants in disproportionately impacted communities, uh, neither of which we believe. Uh, regulations in the three years since the EJ Act passed uh, have uh, have lived up to that mandate. Um, so first, the bill uh, requires uh, the, um, that greenhouse gas emissions not increase in the near term uh, and must not exceed a specific cumulative emissions budget between 2025 and 2030, um, which I'm happy to talk more about in questions. Um, unfortunately, the states ignored the requirement uh, that the EJ Act set to cut pollution quickly uh, and instead allows the 18 facilities regulated under GEM2 to increase their emissions through 2029 by 9% before then hitting uh, the, a, a set target in 2030. Uh, we think that that's a problem uh, for the climate and, uh, and for the communities uh, that, um, uh, that are affected by these facilities. Um, I think that my colleagues are going to talk in a lot of detail about some of the environmental justice provisions uh, in the bill, and I'm running out of time, so I will stop there, uh, and I'm, again, glad to take questions. Thank you. Thank you. Please hold for questions. Ma'am, you are up next. Um, that little red light on the table needs to turn. There you go. You are up. Thank you. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and members of the committee. My name is Colin Tong. Uh, I am here on behalf of Boulder County as the climate and health strategist to testify in support of HB 1339. Boulder County has a major industrial source in the first industrial rulemaking. The Environmental Justice Act was clear in its intent that Colorado's greenhouse gas waste seize the opportunity <coughs> to improve air quality for the most impacted Coloradans. Unfortunately, the rulemaking process did not fully realize this intent and the proponents of the EJ Act have found it necessary to propose key stop gaps to ensure industry cannot sidestep their obligations. I wish to thank the sponsors and especially Representative Weissman for his long dedication to this cause. Local governments, including Boulder County, who worked hard to support the EJ Act, expected that it would finally require industrial polluters to substantially reduce their local impact. Our coalitions worked 
through two role makings to support the priorities voiced by our communities for direct, local, assured, near term, cumulative reductions, and greenhouse gas and air pollutants. We were taken aback when the city's proposal incorporated far more industry demands than community priorities, and further disappointed that the final vote of the Air Quality Control Commission, APCC, ignored the vast majority of public comment at the rulemaking hearing and adopted rules that allow near term emissions increases and compliance without robust on site reductions. HB 1339 is our opportunity to right this wrong. It requires facilities to adversely, that adversely affect disproportionately impacted communities to achieve their GHG reductions on site. This should be a given for the health of neighboring communities and the least we should expect of companies that operate in Colorado. Further, HB 1339 assures that air pollution protections extend to all disproportionately impacted communities rather than the subset adopted by APCC. The introduced version of this bill also sought to restore climate and equity expertise on the APCC that now has so much control over Colorado's course of climate action. While we support the current amendment, we see the legislative process as an important check on the influence of regulated industries in the rulemaking process. Please ensure that the industrial sector is responsible for our communities. We respectfully ask you yes vote on 1339. Thank you. Um, Hello, committee. I urge you to vote yes on the House Bill 1339, a bill that at its core is about accountability for the promises inherent in Colorado's Environmental Justice Act, or EJ Act. The EJ Act recognized the reality that polluting facilities harm communities and that communities of color and low income communities have historically been forced to bear the burden of unsustainably high pollution levels. To move Colorado to a reduction and restorative justice, the EJ Act required two rulemakings which aim to increase protections for impacted communities. The second iteration of the Greenhouse Gas Emissions and Energy Management for Manufacturers Rulemaking, or GEM Rulemaking, and the Disproportionate Impact Community, or DIC Permitting Rulemaking. Unfortunately, the rules adopted to implement these requirements contain numerous loopholes and off ramps that run afoul of the EJ Act's intended protections. The GEM 2 rulemaking was to implement the EJ Act's goal of reducing industrial pollution. Specifically, large industrial emitters are required by law to reduce their climate emissions 20% by 2030. The EJ Act also required that the Air Commission prioritize reductions in Colorado's most impacted communities. Emissions from this sector are critical in meeting our broader economy-wide goals and to protect communities. However, the Gen 2 rules ultimately adopted fall short in several key ways. They don't actually guarantee the level of emis emis emissions reductions required by the EJ Act of the industrial sector. They allow sources to trade and purchase emissions reductions credits towards their compliance and allow sources to pay to, into a pay-to-pollute mitigation fund instead of actually achieving reductions on site. The DIC permitting rulemaking, also spurred by the EJ Act, fell short of the promise of the, of the Act um, as well, which required that the Air Commission to adopt, adopt rules providing for enhanced modeling and monitoring requirements for new and modified sources of protective pollutants in disproportionately affected communities. But critically, the DIC permitting rules ultimately adopted by the Air Commission allow most polluters to avoid monitoring their emissions at the source by paying a vague community monitoring fee, fail to monitor harmful toxic air pollutants, limit its most stringent requirements to only a handful of sources, and improperly divides disproportionately impacted communities into two subclasses, with one class receiving less protection than the other, effectively cutting out half of all DICs from the protections contemplated by the rules. This division of DICs into two subclasses has been harmfully repeated in subsequent rulemakings. This bill will strengthen implementation of the EJ Act to better align with its intent, and I ask for your yes vote. Thank you. Thank you, and Mr. Tafoya, you are up. Hello, Ian Thomas Tafoya, uh, Green Latinos, Colorado State Director. And I think I've been here before to tell you the history of what it took for us to pass the EJ Act, marching across the state pushing against the governor's veto, and then us considering considerable resources from community members to participate both in rulemakings, which have not historically worked out in our favor. The AQCC appointed and unaccountable, only the legislators are able to hold them accountable at this point, because only through lawsuits and settlements have we even gotten close to trying to restore half protections that have been lost through bad precedent for DIC and CIC. We've had great conversations with labor and community leaders about why on-site reductions are important. Community members and workers who are exposed every single day deserve to have these pollutants, these toxics removed from their community. And we know throughout the pandemic that Congress itself released reports about the pandemic of pollution with long-term exposure to these toxics leading to higher morbidity rates and loss of life and culture in some of these communities, in particular, North Denver and Greeley, who were hardest hit 
and where these facilities that we're talking about today are located. We're disappointed that the administrative leadership has joined forces with polluters against our will to push forward loopholes that have continued to harm our community, and we are grateful for the sponsors for standing up with us today. I will note that the city and county of Denver and Commerce City have joined us in opposing what has been done to our communities and supporting 1339. I heard directly from both the mayor of Denver and the mayor of Commerce City, and you are going to hear from them today. I will point out that several of the leaders from Commerce City had a meeting canceled by the governor's administration just moments before as they traveled all the way down here. We had members who rode the bus from Greeley to try to get to some sort of place with the administration on this bill. This is the kind of respect that the environmental justice community gets, even though we sat at the table. You're going to hear from Environmental Justice Action Task Force members who've done the work, who are here to support 1338, 1339, and so many other pieces that we want to collaborate. We want to work with the administration. We want to get to a place where we have better rules and more protections. I just want to take for a minute and tell you about some of the self-reported violations of some of the facilities we're going to talk about today. Both Morrison Coors and Suncor have violations every single quarter for the last three years, with Suncor's as a high priority violation. On the waterfront, Molson Coors, Sterling Ethanol, JBS Sweet Green Packing Plant, Cargill Meat Packing Plant have had violations every single quarter for the last three years. JBS Sweet Map, Meat, 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 Meat Packing Plant, we even went more than two years with a failure to report. Suncor has had violations that have continued to total in the thousands over the last few years. How can we look our communities in the face and say after all of these years we're going to fail to implement it? We're asking the legislators to act. Thank you. Thank you. And um, Lucy Molina does not seem to be online, so we will try and find her in another panel. So right now, folks, this is our panel, and we have five minutes for questions. Please, um, do you have any questions for this panel? Representative Graff. Oh, and Representative Bullock. I'm sorry, first Representative Graff, and then Representative Bullock. I'll start with, uh, let's see, Dr. Tagoya. Um, I'm not really sure what kind of doctor your mother would be proud of, so I will leave that question alone. Um, uh, so, doctor, I'm, I, don't, I don't know if this is on the science front, but you mentioned uh, the, uh, the greenhouse gas thing again and again. This is a uh, bit of a passion of mine, but does the greenhouse gas help or hurt the planet? How much and how so? Um, so, actually, apparently, Lisa Molina is online now, so we're going to hold that question, let her do her um, three minutes, and then we'll come back to questions. My apologies, panel. Um, we're going to bring up Lucy Molina. Lucy Molina, you have three minutes. Thank you for joining us. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Thank you. Sí. Hola, buenas tardes. Uh, Lucy Molina from Commerce City. Uh, thank you all for your public service. And I also would like to thank our, our uh, representatives for sponsoring this bill. So for years and years, I have, uh, I am from a disproportionately impacted community. As many you know, I have been fighting for environmental uh, justice for years in my community. One thing we know is that self-regulation doesn't work. And it's been a history in our style, I guess, in Colorado to have you know the industry guide us. Um, as an impacted resident, these are still baby steps, young, okay, for me. Uh, it's baby steps for justice. Uh, as I know, I can still see it's a necessary steps to meet our 2030 goals in reducing emissions. And I would like to remind, remind all of you guys that we are fighting not only environmental racism, environmental injustice, but there is a global, a global boiling, which is our climate crisis. At the, at the end of the day, we are trying to do uh, what our federal government and our state government is asking for, so uh, we can't contradict these things, right? It is. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to understand this, right? That there is a climate, that that there is a climate crisis and the lack of uh, proper regulation, uh, the lack of strong regulation has led to the cumulative impacts that my community has suffered throughout these decades uh, and all these past century, really. Uh, in communities like ours, uh, absolutely, I am. Uh, I ask um, a yes vote on this uh, bill. I'd also like to remind you guys that uh, I always say this: that justice is not charity. We're not here asking for a favor, okay? Uh, Colorado has been 
uh, leading, uh, has been leading the nation in strong regulation. And I would like to continue be, and I would like to say proudly that, yes, I am a Coloradoan, and I, along with you, we have been able to bring strong, bring forth strong regulation that protects communities like mine. Therefore, I do urge you, uh, and remind you again that self-regulation doesn't work, and that has been what we have been doing all throughout these years, right? Because we know who's in charge. Again, I support, I strongly support this bill, and I ask all of you guys to vote yes on, um, on this bill. Again, thank you very much, Lucy Molina uh, from Commerce City, Colorado, and also Illyria Swansea. As many people know, my family has been strongly and uh, gravely impacted by environmental racism in our communities. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias. Oh. Thank my God, you, 20, yes, my God, 20 seconds, y'all. Good job. <laughs> okay. We're going to continue where we left off with um, the question that Representative DeGraff asked and um, Mr., or excuse me, Dr. DeGolia. Uh, yeah, thank you, Representative DeGraff, for that question. So uh, just the question was, are, um, are greenhouse gases good or bad for the planet, correct? That's the, is that the question? Yeah, what are they, how much? So, I mean, I think my answer to that question would be that the dose makes the poison. We all rely on the greenhouse effect for a livable planet. I don't, I mean, I'm not, I'm not a climate scientist. I know you're looking for climate scientists. I'm not that, but I've hung around a lot of them. And we all rely on the greenhouse effect for a, for a livable planet. And that doesn't mean that substantially increasing the number of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere to intensify that greenhouse effect can't have dramatic adverse consequences for the planet. Thank you so much. And uh, Representative Foley. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and I, I just urge the panel not to feel like you have to relitigate climate change every time you come to our committee. Um, but, uh, and thank you very much for being here. And it's great to see you. Ms. Molina, thank you for joining us. Um, I guess my question is best answered by Mr. Tafoya. You heard, I'm sure, some somewhat dismissive language about even identifying disproportionately impacted communities, and I think by extension, the concept of environmental justice. Can you just comment on the care, whether or not the definition of disproportionately impacted communities is a uh, how that was developed and um, and maybe how it fits into uh, the con related concept of environmental justice. And Mr. Tafoya. Thank you, and as I understand it, the first use of these conversations about uh, disadvantaged communities and other names from the Federal Executive Order for Environmental Justice in 1992 is at least the beginning origins of this. But I will say going back far before the first Earth Day, which is coming on Monday, happens to my birthday, there were many people who are impacted communities from legacy mining, um, from smelting, and all these other kinds of industries that were having negative health effects. The idea of having these burden of communities or disproportionately impacted communities comes from the fact that we needed to find them in order to protect them. And so over the years, we've been able to improve those definitions, both with the Environmental Justice Act. Uh, we did our best as a community uh, to write the bill, to work with the legislators to write the bill, but we set ourselves on an Environmental Justice Action Task Force, of which I was appointed by uh, the Speaker of the House, now Chief of Staffer, Governor Polis, and elected by my peers as the chair. And in this, we went all around the state, had more than 80 meetings, um, defined uh, the disproportionately impacted community definition, came to agreement both with industry uh, as well as uh, administrative uh, the administration and the community members. Uh, we brought that forward into a bill last year that was adopted here. And so you can imagine that when we ended up in a rulemaking that segmented off a piece. Uh, when we had a whole year and a half to talk about this with our community, we were very disappointed. And not only are we pursuing this legislation, as I mentioned before, we're an active litigation against the state in order to make sure that we don't cut off slivers that allow some more protection than others after we collectively uh, made such strides in environmental justice since the George Floyd protest. Because let's be clear, I can't breathe the air means double for our communities and disproportionate impacted communities. Thank you. And back to Representative McGrath. Thank you, Madam Chair. I think I'll, uh, uh, since the environmental science is not going to be a big thing today, so it's not a matter of relitigating. It's a matter of it's a matter of trying to actually bring our, our environmental policy in line with actual science as opposed to unfounded narrative. But, Mr. Tafoya, I am curious. Um, when we look at the, when we look at this 
globally, we're, we're focused on over 48% of our state here in terms of toxins, and I do appreciate your focus on actual toxins as opposed to CO2, which is not. Um, how, do you, how, do you, how do you align uh, a lot of the, uh, the stuff that we're doing? What, do you, what are your thoughts on uh, what goes on in, uh, with, the, uh, with the green movement, the, the stuff that we're pushing here, like EVs, windmills, solar panels, et cetera, that push this pollutant this, uh, the actual produ production of toxins to say third world, Asia, India, those places like that. Does that kind of, or are we only concerned with what goes on in the immediate Colorado? Thank you, and we have about 25 seconds left for this panel. Mr. Tafoya. I appreciate that, Representative. And you and I have had a great conversation the other day about the importance of toxics and why we are trying to get them out of our communities. I can holistically tell you that no environmental justice community wants that to be put onto another community. We need to be talking about systems and how we change our systems to improve the amount of resources we're using to produce a windmill, how it's recycled. We've been committed to all sorts of ideas about circular economy. And what I wanna be clear about is that this rulemaking that we are fighting for would require new technology and jobs and innovation to reduce the amount of pollution and toxics that are coming around these 18 facilities and the communities that they're concentrated in because they're not just like one off there are many of them because of industrial zoning and legacy uh, zoning have placed industrial zoning in one place and therefore many of these in one place and so I, I will tell you I guess environmental justice leaders believe justice belongs to everyone thank you very much um